good morning. morning. Hope that you're doing well today. It's so good to be here. I love Sunday mornings. I love being with you all. So thank you for being here with us. If you would please turn in the Word of God to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to read through verses 3 to 5 today. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 5. I know we get used to the scripture on the screen, I get it, but sometimes it's nice to be able to read it out. Of, if you're in my generation or maybe a, a tad before my generation, there's something different about reading it from paper. I don't know what it is, but it just makes a difference. So if you have your Bible, it's, it's helpful to actually turn to it and read it out of the Word of God. So let's read together. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 to 5, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that, that we can even know you. We thank you, God, that you meet us. Lord, we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would just fall on our hearts, our minds, on this place. Protect us. God, guard our hearts and minds. Show us what, what you want us to know. Speak to us in a way that we can understand, Lord. And God, I, I'm just reminded of all the things going on. We're, we, we read the word stronghold, God, and it seems like there's so much going on in our nation, and our world. Lord, we pray for the people who are affected by the hurricane, Lord. It was so devastating. We pray for comfort and peace that people would be found, Lord, that you would heal. God, every time I hear about Israel, it, it, it doesn't seem like it's getting better. God, we pray for peace there, that the people of Israel would turn to you. God, we pray for our nation, that we would turn to you, Lord, that you would cast down the strongholds that have become just normal in our nation and in our lives, that we would turn to you, and that you would empower us to even be able to do that. Lord, speak to us now and bless us in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. You know, one of my favorite holidays, do you know what my favorite holiday is? It's not Halloween, that's not a holiday. <laughs> it's 4th of July. I love it. I love the patriotism. I love the fireworks. I love the parade. And the fact that we have four little kids means that we get our year's worth of candy and bubble gum in about 25 minutes. It's more than I know what to do with, but not more than they know what to do with, because by the next morning, I start finding the wrappers. So I made my way past the scattering of empty candy packages left by my two-year-old with my coffee in hand to sit next to my wife for 15 minutes before I got to work, and I bent over to adjust one of the pillows that we keep on our couch, and it didn't move. And so I pulled harder, and I felt a stretching. And as the pillow finally gave way, I found what had adhered it to our new couch. It was not a candy wrapper, oh no, but a huge piece of bright pink bubble gum that had been smashed into the cushion. Isn't it amazing how quickly our day can change? How quickly our lives can change with one piece of information? How quickly our mood can change? Brandon was not happy. 20 seconds ago, I was fine. Now I was not fine. So I did what any of us would have done in this situation. I pulled out the strongest weapon that I had. Google. And I started to type in, how do you remove guh? And as soon as I typed in the guh, how do you remove gum from your couch popped up? No joke. And I thought, aha, Google also has a two-year-old. Try using a piece of ice to freeze the gum and chip it off. Well, that sounds dumb. And after 30 minutes of freezing hands, it was dumb and numb. 
oh, I had removed one piece of it, but not the part that was actually smashed into the fabric. Try rubbing alcohol. Nothing. So I made up my own. Acetone. Oh, yeah. And for the next two hours, I attacked this stronghold. And I was angry. What a waste of time. I need to be writing a sermon. I need to be moving on with my day. But instead, I'm dealing with this thing that has stuck itself right into my life. That ever happened to you? You go from perfectly fine to there's a problem to there's a problem, but I can handle it to there's a problem and it is handling me. And these things pop up. They can take us away from our lives. They can take us away from the abundant life that God offers. It even causes us to hold back from God. We can develop fortresses that we don't want God to see. And we definitely don't want God to touch. And we can get wrapped up in the arguments the world has against God. We can even argue with ourselves. And we can have our thoughts work against us. Reasoning out all the ways that we'll never be able to get rid of these strongholds on our own and overcome what is holding us back from following God until we realize that it's God who can pull down strongholds. When we seek Him and rely on His power and on His weapons. Now, Paul, he's about ready to help break down some strongholds. You see some false teaching has led to some bad thinking, which has led to some worse living. And Paul is ready to do some battle. And he says in verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. You ever watched an interview with an athlete before a game? And they say things like, we're going to war. and We're headed to battle. You ever seen that before? When in fact, all they're really doing is playing a game, literally a game for fun and and entertainment. And they're using words like war and battle to represent their mindset and, and how important it is to them. That is not what Paul is doing here. Paul is using the word war literally. It, It is not a euphemism. This is not a game, and Paul is not coming to play. You see, it's, it's really hard to realize sometimes that we are in a battle because we cannot see it, but it is very, very real. Listen to Ephesians 6.12. For we do not wrestle against f- flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. But Satan tries to trick us. Tries to make us think it's, it's all an illusion. There's no real battle. Just a game. And, and you can overcome what you're facing on your own. You know what that's like? To continue our athletics illustration here. That's like being in the ring with Mike Tyson. Blindfolded. Without realizing you are in the fight. That is a real good way to get spiritually punched in the face. Maybe you're being spiritually punched in the face today. And God is trying to remove the blindfold and show you that we can't handle what we are facing on our own. But if we turn to him, he has the weapons that pull down the strongholds in him that are mighty. Verse 4 says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. How many of us know that we can have strongholds in our lives? One of us knows that we can have strongholds in our Thanks, guys. I'm talking to the wrong crowd here. Fortresses that we don't want to surrender. Things that we hold back from God. I'll admit it. Sometimes I do. I hate to admit that, though. None of us like to admit that we're holding things back from God. Nobody wants to admit that. Sometimes we don't even know that we are. How how are we supposed to know that? Start looking for things that make you mad 
when God starts messing with them. Something he pokes, and we get defensive, and we start making excuses for, so that we can keep keeping them back from God. Maybe he reveals to you that every single time someone brings up giving to the Lord or helping in the body of Christ or serving in a ministry like children's church, your mind races with excuses on why you can't do that. God gives us more than an opportunity to just know him, to just love him, He gives us an opportunity to make a difference in his kingdom by living for him. And that's what we're called to do. Listen to Romans 12.1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, so that we hold Nothing back from him. Yeah, but sometimes. Sometimes our strongholds are deeper than that, aren't they? Sometimes they're, they're things that, that we've built, built ourselves that might have taken years to reinforce and we're really good at keeping, keeping God out of. Sometimes we know exactly what they are. And maybe you have a stronghold that God is poking or some unconfessed sin that's, that's eating you up. Maybe there are things you've been doing that you've made excuses for and tried to hide from everybody around you and even try to, try to hide from God. You need to listen to this. If that's you, God loves you and he is for you. He's waiting for us to turn to him so that we can repent, so that he can restore us and we can be confident that he will make us conquerors over those things that are against us. Romans 8.37 says, Yet in all these things, the things that try to hold us back from God, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. Maybe you don't feel like a conqueror today. Anybody have those times where you just don't feel, like you feel like you're being conquered? Yeah, we all have that. There's not a single person who doesn't feel that sometimes. Sometimes we feel like we're being conquered. Maybe you feel like you're being conquered today, that you are not a conqueror. That's a great verse, Brandon. But one verse said quickly is not going to immediately heal a lifetime of struggle and hurt and things that have moved from just a stronghold to part of my self-image, who I see myself as. How am I supposed to change those things? Those things that seem like they've taken over. Things that are so hard to change. It's like an uphill battle. If there's anybody who might have understood that, it's probably Josiah. Josiah was eight years old when he became king of the nation of Judah. Can you imagine that? Talk about a dream come true if you're eight till the reality sinks in. He inherited a lot of terrible things from his father, Ammon. The second Chronicles 33, 22 to 23, this is talking about his daddy. He did evil in the sight of the Lord as his father Manasseh had done. For Ammon sacrificed to all the carved images which his father Manasseh had made and served them. He did not humble himself before the Lord as his father Manasseh had humbled himself, but Ammon trespassed more and more. That's this boy's role model. Now, he is king of a nation that had been led by his father into idolatry. That was their self-image. That was how they saw themselves as. Jeremiah the prophet calls out these people for exactly that. Replacing God with worthless idols to the point, to the point where these strongholds were part of them. To the point where it was normal. How would you feel if you were Josiah? If I was him, honestly, I'd feel too young. I'd feel like I'm too young to make any difference, to do anything of value for this nation that's already ruined by sin. It'd be easier just to go with the flow. Would anybody feel that way at eight years old? But at 16, something happens to Josiah. 
2 Chronicles 34, verse 3. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, he began to seek the God of his father, David. If that's confusing, if you're, if you're new to the Bible a little bit and you're like, well, wait, I thought Ammon was his father. They use the word father there to represent uh, like grandfathers and great grandfathers and their ancestors. And so that's what he's, he's talking about there. He began to seek the God of his father. If you think that you are too young to make a difference in the kingdom of God, you got that one wrong. You're not the generation of the future. You're the generation of right now. Where's my young people at? Good. What you choose matters. And what you do matters. And what you seek matters. And if you are a new believer and you think you are too young in your faith to make a difference to the kingdom of God, you got that one wrong. You are relevant to the Lord right now. Listen to 1 Timothy 4.12. Let no one despise your youth but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. No matter how young you are, in your age, or your walk, you're called to represent God to the world, even though that's scary. Josiah was up against a nation that was scary. Like literal strongholds where people worshipped false gods under every tree. And they did not want to change. And every time one of them was threatened, the people got defensive. That kind of sounds familiar. I'll tell you what, if I was Josiah, I'd be overwhelmed. How am I supposed to conquer what I know God is calling me to overcome when I don't even know how to take the first step? Maybe you felt that in your life. I know that I have. God pokes something, he starts calling me out for something that's been so ingrained in who I am and what I've done for so long, it feels like I can't change it. It feels unchangeable, like anger. Sometimes I get angry, even at little things that don't even matter. But I still let it ruin my day. And then I get angry because I got angry. How am I supposed to start? How am I supposed to deal with that? Some of you are laughing because you relate. Maybe you feel overwhelmed. Because you don't feel like you can change these things or overcome these things that are keeping you back from following God with all your heart. Maybe you can't. God can. Do you know that he promises to help you escape the strongholds that come up in our lives? Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4 says, As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life, godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which we have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers, you get, of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Josiah, he starts seeking the Lord at 16. And he leads his nation from death into life by tearing down strongholds. Second Chronicles 34, 8 continues, In the 18th year, of his reign, when he had purged the land and the temple. He's, oh, there's some fun names in here. He sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, Maasiah, the governor of the city, and Joah, the son of Joahaz, the recorder, to repair the house of the Lord his God. In the 18th year of his reign. You need to get this. It took 10 years between seeking the Lord and purging the idols. If you are anything like me, you pray for patience, and then you get frustrated because you have to wait for it. That, this took longer than a day. 
Maybe you're getting frustrated because things aren't working, moving as fast as you would like them to, and you aren't perfect yet. And if you think you are perfect, just ask the person next to you, and you will realize how wrong you are. God does work in us. God does sanctify us by the Holy Spirit in us, making us more like Him and into the image we were designed to be. But it takes more than a day. If you want to see real, life-changing, temple-building, idol-crushing, stronghold-destroying work in your lives, you have to choose it. It takes dedication to God through faith in Jesus Christ. It takes consistency in the word. And it takes surrendering to the Holy Spirit so that you can run this race with endurance as you're called to do. In Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, it says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to who? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. This is Josiah's heart. Seeking the Lord for a decade of hard work with endurance. Looking to God, just like we look to Jesus Christ, who not only knows what we face and fully understands it, but also gives us the power to overcome the strongholds we are powerless against. In Hebrews 4, 15 and 16, it says, We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Did you know our God is all-powerful? How many people know that, that our God is all-powerful? Do you know that? Do you know that the help he gives, the weapons that he has, that they are mighty? That word is dunatos, dynamic. They are power. And with the power of God, in our lives, things change. Even as we struggle against strongholds we have no power over on our, on our own, God is still working. He promises to complete the work that he started in us. In Philippians 1.6, it says, We can be confident, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. As we keep our faith in him. In patience, that's hard for me. In opposition, even in things that argue against us. And in verse 5, we say that these things can cast down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. You ever had an argument with, about God with someone who does not know them? Sometimes we can get so angry, we get so mad that we just, we just want to scream. Would you just be quiet and listen that God loves you? He loves you. And everybody leaves angry. And it's not edifying. And we just wonder, what, why is it so hard for them to see the truth? Why can't they see the truth? 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 illustrates that. It says, Whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. They're blind to the truth. They just can't see it yet. We are to respond in love, patience, kindness, knowing who we reflect. You see, we, we reflect someone in this world, in this, in this life. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, 
just as by the Spirit of the Lord in us. In the body of Christ, a reflection of that glory is revealed. You are a reflection of that glory. Did you know that? The goodness of God. You're a reflection of that. And you're called to reflect the image of Christ to this world. You are a new creation that they can't ignore. And even though the world will debate the truth of God with ridiculous logic, an example after example of things that are better than God or higher than God, we're to respond in love and in the word of God, which, which is not just logic, but truth. And is one of the spiritual weapons that we're given to cast down every debate, to cast down every argument, even the ones that we have with ourselves. You ever do that? Start arguing with yourself, then you realize that your monologue has become a dialogue and you are hoping that you are not crazy. Just me? You do that? Especially when we're arguing with ourselves about God? There's a lot of people in this room who understand that one, don't we? I do. I've been there. We argue with ourselves about whether God really loves us. We argue with ourselves about whether our faith is sincere enough. We argue with ourselves about whether God has really saved us or just other people. And we can argue ourselves to the point where we have convinced ourselves that God has changed his mind about us and that he has condemned us. And there's nothing we can do about it. That is Satan's goal for you. He will whisper in your ear until he convinces you that all those doubts that you have are true. And there's no way that God could redeem you. You need to get this. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you need to know Romans 8.1. Romans 8.1 says, There is therefore now some. Why don't we read that out loud? I won't do that. There is therefore now for those Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the Spirit, according to the Spirit. That's right. How are we supposed to do that? You need to know that God has given you that Spirit. To be able to do that, you need to know our God and draw near to Him. James 4.8 says, draw near to God. He will draw near to you. That's what Josiah did. He sought the Lord, and he found his word. So in 2 Chronicles 34.14, Now when they had brought out the money that was given into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. Did you catch that? I didn't. Probably the first ten times that I read this, I can be a slow learner. It's just, I speed read it, glance over it, doesn't sink in. Anybody happen like that to them? Probably read it ten times before it really sunk in. I'm going to read it again. Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. The priests of God did not have the word of God. What? They lost the word of God. Or at least they were not using it. They got so wrapped up in the world, the idols that had popped up around them, they'd misplaced the word of God. Have you ever lost the most important thing in the world? They did. Maybe you have lost the word of God. And you're not spending time in it. And it just sits there on a shelf. Unused. It's really easy to get wrapped up in the busyness of the world. And the things we're chasing after and the idols that pop up all around us that we misplace the supreme importance of the Word of God in our lives. And pretty soon, we we aren't just misplacing it. We're not even looking for it. 
I know some of you are thinking, wow, Brandon, you are laying that on pretty heavy, man. I know the word of God is important, but come on, man. That was these guys' jobs, right? They, they were priests. This might mess some of you up. So are you. 1 Peter 2.9 says, but you are a chosen generation. Get this, a royal priesthood. What? A holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Revelation 1.6 makes it even more clear. And he, Christ, has made us kings and priests. Or a kingdom of priests. To his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. You are a priest. It is part of who you are. Your true and real identity. And the word of God is more than just your job description. But along with the Holy Spirit is the tool that you have to live it out. The Word of God is your sword in this very real battle that we are in. And it should be stuck to our hands and stuck in our hearts. And when it is, our lives change. 2 Corinthians 34, 18 and 19. Then Shaphan the scribe told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. Thus it happened. When the king heard the words of the law, that he tore his clothes, let this sink in. Ten years into seeking the Lord and the word of God still cut him to the heart. That's what happens. That is what the word of God does in our lives. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And for some of us, that might be happening right now. And maybe you feel that tension as God is calling you to surrender what is holding you back from Him. And every single time that happens, we have a choice. We could ignore it. And we could push it aside. And we can protect that fortress that we do not want to let God into. Or we can surrender it and yield to him. And let him tear down the stronghold. And let him cast down the argument. And realize who we are to him. Loved. Valued. Sought after like a lamb in the wilderness. So that we can trust in him. So that we can follow him. So that we can rely on him. Who knows exactly the war that we're facing. And loves us not only enough to give us the weapons. And fight the battles. But give us his power to do the same thing. We just have to use him. Well I gave up. I gave up after trying everything that Google recommended. To remove gum from a couch. It would forever be stuck to our brand newish blue couch and forever stuck in my life. And so I rationalized it. I'll just put the cushion back. I'll put the pillow over it. And no one will ever know. We'll just never move the pillow. And so I walked to the trash can with my acetone soaked paper towel. And as I threw it in, I glanced down at the wad of pink bubble gum that I had removed earlier and thrown away. And it had been moistened by other trash from the morning. And it looked a little different. Almost like it had dissolved a little bit. So I did what any of us would have done in the situation. I licked it. <laughs> Me. I blame the acetone. It was cinnamon. And it was not gum. It was salt water taffy that had been partially dissolved by water from a damp paper towel. 
I completely misidentified my own stronghold and used completely the wrong thing to try to remove it. Five minutes, a little water. No, get this, this is real. What I was prepared to live with for the rest of my life was gone. Whoa. Look, when God calls out a stronghold in our lives, we have a few options. We can put the pillow back over it. Don't lick it. We can put the pillow... You can put the pillow back over it, and you can cover it up, and you can try to hide it, you can try to protect it, and you can try to rationalize it, that, that it's not really that big of a problem, and we can just live with it. We can try to attack it with our own tools, and whatever Google says is going to solve the problem. Or, we can surrender it to God, the only one who knows exactly what we are facing the only one who knows exactly how to overcome it. The only one who will overcome it and promises when we come to him that he does that. Who gives us exactly what we need. The living water by the Holy Spirit in us who pulls down any stronghold and washes away any stain so that we can live the life we're called to live. Maybe you know that there's an area in your life that you're keeping back from God. And it's something that you're trying to hide from Him. And you're putting the pillow back over it because it's sticky and it's gross and it's, it's holding you down and, and it's taking over your days, but you're embarrassed and you don't want God to see it. You got to know that God already knows our very hearts. He knows the things that we try to hide from him. And he loves you enough to want more than that for you. He's waiting. Don't try to convince him and convince yourself that we can handle it on our own. Surrender to him. Come to him in prayer. The same God who died for you on Calvary will cleanse you and sanctify you now. 1 John Chapter 1, 8 and 9 says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. Let's make everybody feel comfortable in here, okay? Because some people feel called out when they come to church for the first time. And they're like, well, all these people are sin. How many people have sin in their lives? Like, you're a sinner? Anybody? No, okay, five of us don't. Good, all right. <laughs> you're sanctified and you may go. We all do. But listen to what God does. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Maybe you got people who you love, whose strongholds are keeping them back from the Lord, and you have reasoned with them and debated with them and argued with them, and now you just feel like giving up because it feels like a battle. It is. We're waging a, a war for souls trying to batter down the gates of hell and prevent people from taking the path there and help pull down strongholds in the lives of people we love that are robbing them of life in the Lord. Don't give up on them. Walk with them. Pray for them. Help bear their burdens. Galatians 6.2 says, Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. That's what we're called to do. Out of love for them. Get this, not seeking to condemn them, not seeking to point fingers and to gossip, but restoring them to our Heavenly Father, because we've been in some of those places. Out of love, what we do is meaningless without that. What we say is meaningless without that. If you don't believe me, listen to 1 Corinthians 13, 1 and 2. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass. Or a clanging symbol. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Our effectiveness is found in what God has given us love, and His Word, and His Spirit, and prayer. 
people are not screamed into the kingdom of God. They are prayed into the kingdom of God. Strongholds are not torn down by weapons of this world, but by the word of God and the Holy Spirit moving in lives. Maybe you got a stronghold today. God's revealing it to you. Anger. Unforgiveness. Gossip. Pride. Lust, these things that we try to hide in the dark corners of our lives. And it's starting to ruin your relationships. God does not want that for you. He doesn't call these things out to try to condemn you and drive you away. But to draw you to the only one who can actually pull it down in your life. To draw you to God. To draw you to himself. So that as, as we follow him and his word and surrender to him. That the Holy Spirit will lead us to renew our minds in him. Do you know that's the goal? To get our minds renewed? Romans 12.2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This takes time. It takes obedience. This takes prayer. It takes seeking the Lord. Pray with God. Consider fasting. We do not talk about fasting enough. There is power there. It can turn the volume of God's voice up by lowering the noise in your life. It's not about losing weight. Maybe a happy side benefit, I don't know. It's about waiting on the Lord. It's not about getting your will. It's about seeking His. It's about going without food because you have dedicated yourself to seeking your Savior. Start with the day. Start with just a time, even 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Seek the Lord, diligently asking him to move in your life. Seek him in the word of God and in prayer with a journal beside you so that he can move and expect that he will. Expect that he will show up with faith that he will do so. And seek him, seeking the Lord, so that we can walk according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh. Because you know who's going to pull down strongholds in your life? It's God. When we seek him with all our heart. When we rely on his power and his word and his spirit. Lord God, we want to seek you. Sometimes we don't even know what that means. Sometimes we don't, we don't even know, but you do. I pray that you would move in our hearts and our minds so that we would seek you, that we would dedicate ourselves to you and that you would show up. God, I pray that you would reveal strongholds we don't even know are there, but then encourage us that you can tear them down. God, I pray that you would give us endurance. Sometimes we want things to change in a moment. Sometimes they do. God, you are a God of miracles. You do still do miracles. You are still active. But sometimes it takes more than that, God. Help us to seek you with endurance. To really make you the priority, Lord. I pray that you would change our hearts, change our lives. That we would not only yearn for you, not only seek you out, but that we would find you. God, thank you for the time that you give us. I pray that we would not squander it. Lord, that we would build your kingdom here, that you would empower us to do it. In the name of Jesus, we pray this. Amen.